My name is Julie Ann Link and welcome to the Music Link. This week on the Let's Link project, I'd like to welcome the principal bassoonist of the National Symphony Orchestra, Sue Heinemann. Sue, thank you so much for being here. Hi, Julie. <laughs> for everyone watching, Sue and I met about 15 years ago at the Meg Quigley Vivaldi Competition and Symposium in Ithaca, New York. Sue also has a New Zealand residency and I hope to meet up with her here to go tramping one day. Um, Sue, please share an overview of who you are and what you do as a professional musician. Thanks. Okay, so, um, yeah, the New Zealand thing. Every time I hear that, I'm like, oof, right now would be a really good time to go back to New Zealand. <laughs> yes. Um, so before it was in New I used to play in New Zealand Symphony, and that's why I have residency there. Um, if I'd gotten my act together a little bit sooner, I could have actually had citizenship. Um, wow. But um, the residency does allow me to you know, come back. I, yes. I can, I can go back there. Um, anyway, I grew up in Philadelphia and, um, my first bassoon teacher was Ferdinand Del Negro, who is the guy, if you've ever seen Fantasia, the big giant contra bassoon, that was him. Wow. And, um, he was like in his eighties when I was studying with him. And then, um, then he started studying with Shirley Curtis, who, um, just passed away last, uh, well, a year, about a year and a half ago. Mm. Um, and she um, was also Judy LeClaire's teacher and oh. um, Hugh Mitchie, um, but, but it's from Cincinnati, a bunch of, she's had a, a few, um, Dan Shelley from the Met was also one of hers. And it was, that was really my first sort of, even though I had been studying with a guy who had been in the Philadelphia Orchestra, and now I was with somebody who was currently playing. She was principal in the Pennsylvania Ballet. Her husband was in the viola section of the Philadelphia Orchestra, and they had a town home downtown. And around that time, I also joined the Philadelphia Youth Orchestra, and I started going to Eastern Music Festival. So it was just like in this explosion of like, like I was now like immersed in like the classical music scene and um, very serious about it. Although I still often wondered, um, like, do I want to do this? Are we going to? go into music was the term. I don't know if that's a common thing, if that's just my, what my friends and I, are you going to go into music? Have you decided, are you going to go into music? <laughs> yeah, it's, yeah, it's hard. It's hard to, to figure it out. Um, um, and I just kind of month after month, year after year, could not really decide like if I want, you know, it wasn't ever like, this is the only thing I could do, mm -hmm. but, um, I also, I don't know, I, I, there was something, it's, it's really interesting, even from this perspective, all these many decades later, um, trying to figure out like what exactly was going on with that, like, was, you know, you get into something, you know, there's so many things that, that affect like how, like who you meet and like, how, why did I pick the bassoon? It just happened to be the various people in my junior high that this mm -hmm. person played this and this person played that and that person seemed cool and that person seems happy and let's take that one. It kind of, it wasn't, uh -huh. you know, I was like a little kid and, um, but I mean, I knew I was good at it. I was definitely getting the kind of feedback that this, mm -hmm. that, you know, I mean, and, and the fact that I was studying with somebody who right around the time I started studying with her was when Judy was winning the New York Phil job. So, it, you know, I kind of felt like I was in a world where like, I mean, she wouldn't have, she wouldn't have encouraged me if she didn't think I had some shot, right? At, you know, um, you know, being having some success, but it was never like there's no guarantees. I mean, there's no mm -hmm. guarantees back then, and um, and I remember um, when I was in how old was I? I was probably it's probably around tenth grade or something. I did a side by side with Philadelphia Orchestra wow. and played with Bernard Garfield, who basically asked me if I like computers and you know suggested that I go into anything other than music because there are no jobs. I don't think it was anything having to do with you know me playing poorly. Um, couldn't right. have heard it. I mean, it was we were playing Ho Down <laughs> uh -huh. and and. Some other guy, it was, whoever was playing the second bassoon part, jumped in right at, on top of a fermata. Garfield told me, I remember, he said, now make sure you wait for that. And I was like, that was not me. Was uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, the point is, it's just funny to, to think about how long ago that was. It was in the 80s, like mm -hmm. by 1980, and you know, still being told like there's no jobs and you should wow. consider going to anything else. Um, but I, you know, I guess I just figured, uh, I ended up going to Eastman um, 
on Sh Shirley Curtis's recommendation. That was that was where Judy had gone. Van Dusen. That was just that was just like the basically the only place that we even really talked about going. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, my parents were concerned <laughs> that whether I was whether this was going to be something that where I could have a job um, uh -huh. in the future. And they would often want to talk with first Mrs. Curtis and then Mr. Van Heusen about, you know, what are her chances, whatever. And, um, and I mean, I remember Van Heusen would often say just like, you know, you can always go back to school for something else. Mm -hmm. if, you, if it doesn't work out, or if you decide this isn't for you, but this is just kind of ham and haw right now is that's sort of like, kind of like guarantee that this isn't going to work out. So, you know, his recommendation was just really focus on this and, you know, you, yeah, you're not going to go to medical school and then decide in your thirties, you want to become a professional bassoonist. But if, you know, you can decide in your, I mean, I had, in fact, I knew somebody who in her fifties had gone back to medical school. So that was always reassuring to know that there uh -huh. was that option. And, um, you know, and I did take some just regular liberal arts courses, mostly at Eastman, actually, they had really excellent liberal arts courses. So I took some English classes, some history, a bunch of language. Um, went over University of Rochester to pick up some science credits. And before you knew it, I had a Bachelor of Arts. So it, it was just kind of helpful. Yeah, I think it made my dad happy <laughs> to mm -hmm. have that, um, something to, to fall back on. Um, mm. In retrospect, I don't think that was even necessary, honestly, because if I'd gone, needed to go to medical school, I still would have had to take all the science courses. So mm -hmm. whatever. <laughs> um, and um, then when I was a senior, I applied for, um, I wasn't really sure what I was going to do. I had mm -hmm. no idea. Um, you know, and I, I'd seen like Judy just had a bachelor's and then she had a little job for a year and a half. And then she, you know, it's like, is that what you do? But it's like, Hmm, I don't feel at all ready for this. <laughs> so mm. then I applied for a couple of grad schools and I applied for Fulbright. And so I got the Fulbright and I moved to Austria for a year and study with Milan Trigovich. And sometimes when he was traveling, I got to study with his teacher, Carl Erberger, which was very cool. Mm. Um, and, um, I mean, it was a tough year in a way for me because I, it's, you know, again, it, it's, I became this sort of traveler adventurer, but at that time I was really freaked out about like the idea of like moving abroad and yes. living alone in a foreign country. And I mean, my German was okay, but I, it wasn't great. And I, I was living in a home and I rented a room from like an older woman. Mm -hmm. like, it wasn't like we were like chit chatting. I would have, I mean, I, you know, if I could do it all again, I would like have lived in a dorm situation and just really been around more people. And, right. um, and, um, that was before I discovered hiking. So like I'm living in the Alps and I'm not even hiking. It's just so wow. sad. It's just sad. And, and so then toward the end of the year, I was still like, now what do I do? I have no uh -huh. idea what to do. So I thought, well, I guess I'll move back to America. Maybe, right. I don't know, maybe New York would be a good place. So I guess I'll apply for Juilliard. And um, so, and a lot of, several of my friends that I had known coming up through um, Eastman had now mm -hmm. gone to Juilliard. And so, you know, it, 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 it seemed, it was certainly seemed realistic. And, uh, you know, I flew back, I took the audition. Um, and so then I moved back to New York and I lived there for six years. Wow. Um, I studied with Judy um, for a while. And then I also studied with Steve Maxim, um, which is a, kind of really good, you know, combination of, uh, Maxim was, was just this whole kind of a different school, like, you know, with Mrs. Curtis and Van Hoosen and Judy, it was just like, so like orchestrally, like, how do I, you know, I mean, I definitely had a sense. I always had a sense, like, if I want to do this, I want an orchestra job. I wasn't thinking like, it never occurred to me to like take music ad or something or like it, I just, I, I thought there are other things other than playing in an orchestra, but I, you know, I'll probably do something completely else. I, I wasn't thinking like, maybe I want to get a doctorate and get a university position. That was also just not something that was really on my radar mm -hmm. um, or, or a chamber music career either. I wanted to play in an orchestra. That's, that was really the, uh, the thing. I'm, there's a cat here. That's what all this motion is. <laughs> <You know>. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> now we're stuck. Um, <laughs> so, um, yeah, so, uh, I mean, it was funny because, yeah, like, Maxim obviously had been principal in the Met, but he just, it, it was just a very different kind of style of teaching, and mm -hmm. um, so it, it, it was a really good balance for for the Van Hoosen, Judy, Shirley kind of block that I got, um, and um, and then and then from there I started taking lots of auditions. I joined the Aspen Wind Quintet, so I did have a 
a chamber music thing going and, and freelancing. And then, um, and then I was just like, I was like 29. I was like, ugh, you know, every time I took an audition and I would, I was doing well at auditions pretty, um, regularly. I was, I was making a lot of finals and not getting the jobs. And, mm. and I would realize that I would kind of feel this weird sense of relief when I didn't get it, mm -hmm. um, which, you know, I think, I think I just had this idea that I mean, I mean, I just, that I was not that I, even if I won the job, like I would fail. It's, I mean, it, this is whole, mm. like, you know, the more, the more people I talk to about this, you know, the more like imposter syndrome seems to be like a pretty yeah. widespread thing. Um, somebody recently asked me about what it was. So I sent the Wikipedia article and it's like, Michelle Obama, you know, everybody's got it. Right? Yes. Um, but yeah, somehow, despite, you know, many more, um, approvals than disapprovals. I still had this idea that if I actually went in a symphony job, I wouldn't be happy. Like uh -huh. that I would be just constantly being berated by the conductor. I don't know. I don't know where that comes from. That was not, I didn't, that didn't happen to me in orchestras crying. I mean, a little bit, maybe like in the Philadelphia Youth Orchestra, we had a conductor who liked to yell at people, but it was kind of uh -huh. shtick. Uh -huh. you know, it, it, he wasn't like really, you know, humiliating people. I don't know. It, but I mean, the point was, I, I just started thinking maybe, maybe I really do want to, maybe it's about time to start studying something else. So uh -huh. Uh -huh. I, um, moved to Memphis and then to New Mexico, both the times, you know, to join the orchestras. But now I was, instead of being in New York where I was freelancing and taking the subway and commuting up to New Haven and having a 20 hour week day job so that I could have insurance. Mm -hmm. Um, I had a regional orchestra study salary with, with health benefits. Mm -hmm. And then I could, um, start taking classes in like biology or something. Wow. So I did that for a little bit. Um, but then that sort of petered out when I realized that yeah, this isn't so bad. I'm getting paid to play. I mean, I, through all of this, I liked playing. I still yes. always loved playing in the orchestra. It was just more, I think it was just more like this sort of panic, like, well, what am I going to do? Where am I going to end up? Am uh -huh. I ever going to win a job? You know, and then it, sometimes there'd be a boyfriend involved and like, what if that, if I win, then he's going to be here and I'm going to be there. And it's just like all that, you know, yes. you see the look of knowing in your eyes, <laughs> right? Yes. It's hard, right? It's, it's, it's a, it's a terrible time of life. <laughs> yeah. It, takes it was a lot very, of very miserable in my twenties. Uh -huh. it, really, it was really hard. Um, so then what happened, um, was that I ended up, Actually, there was a man involved. I, we were both in New Mexico and we both got jobs in, in New Zealand. Uh -huh. So we, and I was like, okay, this is amazing. You know, after all that sort of, you know, back and forth, I'm going to like, you know, have this job and a really good orchestra and a beautiful place to live and blah, blah, blah. Well, uh -huh. then we broke up, but then I ended up staying in New Zealand anyway. And yes. that was like the, really the first time that I ever felt like I had a job that was, you know, like a, this is something I could see mm -hmm. continuing for, you know, years. I could see settling here and, um, yeah, it was amazing. It's, that's a, that's a very nice country you got there, especially now it's so, oh my gosh, it's so, it's so frustrating. Um, mm. um, for those who aren't aware the, uh, that country's open, their orchestras are playing. <laughs> right. Um, so yeah, so we, um, so I stayed there for a few years and, and I kept taking auditions kind of just, it wasn't like I necessarily at that point wanted to leave. I just realized that I actually do like the audition process. I actually liked preparing for auditions. It really yeah. gave me a project. It, it gave me a focus, um, mm -hmm. you know, and, um, I was coming back to the States, you know, to visit my family anyway. So I'd be like, yes. oh, here's, you know, this audition. So I, I can I took a couple from New Zealand, um, finals, didn't win whatever. And then, and then, uh, then I won a job in, in the national symphony. Um, and, and even with that, I wasn't really entirely sure what I was going to do. Um, mm. at first I won the second bassoon job. That was the first opening that they had that year. I, um, I mean, I remember Danny either calling or writing me in New Zealand, Danny Matsukawa saying, Hey, you know, we're there. he had just won Philly, but they had two openings in the NSO. They had the, the second bassoon and then they were going to replace him. So I came to the second bassoon audition and I won that. And I, we went out for lunch afterwards and he was saying, you know, people were saying they, they think maybe you ought to come try out for the principal job. And I was like, <gasps> me, you know, I just didn't have that kind of confidence. Mm. I just I somehow wasn't, it hadn't even occurred to me that I could 
compete for the principal bassoon job. So I, um, so I did, and I came back, and I did not win it, but the guy who won it, Bill Bookman, decided he wanted to stay in Chicago. So, and it had been him and between him and me. So then they said, well, do you want to come and play for a year as acting principal? And I was like, sure. Yeah. And, you know, even with that, I, that gave me the sort of out, like, I was like, okay, I'll just go and play for a year. And if I don't like it, I can move back to New Zealand. Like I left boxes and boxes of stuff back in New Zealand. I was really not sure. Even then uh-huh. I was not sure that I was really going to stay in the States. Um, mm. And, um, and, but I think honestly, have, having had, having won the second bassoon audition and then not quite winning the first, but then being offered to, to play a year, it was, I think that really kind of helped me get through that sort of sense of, I can't do this. I mean, mm. it, it, it's funny. Cause I mean, you know, in New Zealand, I played, you know, quite a bit of Prince. I was assistant principal there, but I, you know, I played some big stuff and yes held my own and yeah there was there was no actual realistic outward messaging coming in to say to to make me think that i couldn't do this but Mm. it was really a gift to be able to come here and have like i had this idea that well if they really wanted me for principal they probably would have just offered me the principal job so but they didn't but they just offered me the one year so i may as well just make the most of it this is all i'm gonna get and then i'll go back to new zealand and so I did that and it just, I was actually able to be like a lot calmer about it. I didn't feel like I was trying to prove anything or trying to hold on to a job. I kind of had this assumption that they were going to hire, you know, they're, they're looking for somebody good. They're going to mm. hire somebody else. And so, <laughs> so, so then, you know, I, I played and then, and then I took the audition again. So this is now my third audition for the, in the same calendar year. Um, and that one I won. So, and then, but, and again, it's just like, okay, well, I guess I probably don't have to worry too much about tenure now, because I've already played here for three months and then they hired me after the audition. So yeah, in a way it was, it was the perfect, uh, perfect storm of, of situation, uh, you know, for me to come into, you know, a much bigger situation than what I had been in before. And, mm-hmm. and I mean, I, having said that, I mean, we have people coming in here straight out of Juilliard. I don't know how they do that. Wow. I mean, people coming in who have not finished or like a principal trumpet was, I don't think he was finished his degree when he won. We have several people who win jobs like right after it's like their first job. Uh-huh. I, 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 I feel like I would have fallen apart if I had tried to do this at that age. Maybe not. I don't know. Mm. They don't. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, so could you share? So that's my very long story. And just, just oh. to say that it's like, I mean, I was 35 when I got this job, which is, that's a lot older than, I mean, th- th- there are handfuls of things, you know, like that, like, like the Whitney, you know, moving from the Met to LA, you know, like seasoned professionals that, but there's, there are a lot of people who win these jobs are, are significantly younger. Um, so it, yeah, it, it, it was a, a long indirect journey to get here for sure. Hmm. Could you share more about your teaching career? So when I got the job here, um, I, it kind of came with a, a, just an adjunct position at University of Maryland. And I was just going to take over the, Danny had a couple students and he said, you know, could you take these? There was another teacher, um, Linda Harwell, who had been in the NSO for many, many years and had been teaching at UMD for many years. And she was like the main teacher there. And then Danny had a couple. So I took his and um, and actually one of them ended up leaving me to go back to Linda, making me feel like a really great teacher. <laughs> but I mean, Linda's awesome and stuff. It's, I don't mean that at all. I mean, she was wonderful, but it was, I was just not that focused on teaching. And mm-hmm. what happened was that I was kind of kind of thinking, you know, I don't think, let, let's just, you know, I don't need to do this. And then what happened was that Linda decided to move to Texas. So I get this call saying, could you take over the studio? I'm just like, really? <laughs> I was just about to tell you I don't need more students. But they said, you know, we'd, we'd love for you to do this and, you know, you can build something here. And I think, you know, I mean, it's a good idea. And I, um, I really admire people who, who do a lot of teaching. And, and I, I definitely, you know, it's not finally at this point, I'm like, I do have something to share. But um, it just wasn't, it hadn't been something that I was dying to do. But but mm. I, I did it and I went really, 
I, I, I got in, I dug in for that. And I, and I, I did that for, I think it's been about five years since I left the job. So maybe it was, there's probably about 10 years where I was like there, like trying to build a studio. And yes. that's where like the Samantha came in. She was like, you know, my first like superstar student and, you know, and, and I, you know, I've had a few more and that's, that's was really fun. And so I was teaching, um, but you know, as an adjunct and riding my bike back and forth and it just, after a while, I was just kind of realized I would rather have, I was starting to get into running actually around that time. And also like all the animals. And I just kind of, just one day I was just like, this is overall, I think I'd rather have this time for other things. Yes. Kind of thing. A couple of my colleagues had also left their teaching positions and it kind of gave me a little bit of courage uh -huh. um, to, to just reallocate my time to something uh -huh. else. Um, so, I mean, now, like if people come to me for one-offs or whatever, you know, I, I, I don't have any students at, at the moment. Um, but you know, occasionally somebody will come and play for me before, um, yes. auditions, that kind of thing, or master classes, that, that kind of stuff. Mm. But, yeah, that, that was sort of the, uh, it was sort of a short lived teaching career. Mm. Could you share about your chamber music career? So, yeah. And so I mentioned that I had been in Aspen wind quintet and when I was in New York, I did. I played a couple times, like with the Chamber Music Society of Lincoln Center and mm. various other chamber things that would come and go. Um, once I got the NSO job, um, it's you know basically now and then the wind principals will do something together, kind of a thing. Mm -hmm. um, so it's it's not. Um, I mean, when I was freelancing, yeah, there was I, I subbed in with a bunch of other wind quintets and that kind of stuff. But yeah, it, that that's the kind of the extent of it. Mm. I don't have like an ongoing kind of thing right now. I mean, I, yeah, we have some friends, you know, like sometimes with the NSO we'll do like outreach. So uh -huh. like I, I'll get together a trio with some colleagues and we'll go and play in retirement homes, kind of that kind yeah. of stuff. Um, they've been doing a lot this year for like the first responders at, at retirement homes, hospitals, that kind of mm. stuff. Um, that, that's not really a chamber music career though, really. That's just kind of <laughs> an offshoot of being in the NSO. Uh huh. Do you have a favorite concert experience that you could share about? Boy, that is always a tough one. Mm. I, I, I wanted to ask you that. Like, yeah, do people, I mean, there's, there's so many, uh -huh. there's so many. And, um, I mean, there, there are lots of things that one does not remember, um, uh -huh. just because you're doing it week after week. And, right. Um, you know, I can, uh, I, I, I pass. <laughs> is there like an orchestral piece that comes to mind, um, you know, or, uh, you know, that was a highlight or that you love playing or any specific bassoon solo or? Oh, I mean, there are all kinds of things. Like the very first opera I ever did was when I was a sophomore at Eastman and I was married to Figaro. And I had no idea, you know, I knew that there was such a piece. I had heard of the overture. I don't think at that point I'd even started working on the overture. I didn't know that that was an audition excerpt, but I, that was what I got signed. First bassoon, uh -huh. Marriage of Figaro. And, and then I went the first, the first, I was like, oh my God, <laughs> that was amazing. There's so much, there's so much to play. And then I, and it was also like the first time I got really intimately acquainted with any opera. So, I mean, that is definitely like one of those like lifetime memories, like playing that. And I remember like we had four performances and after the last one, I was just like, you know, I was like, I wish we could do this 12 more times. And, yes. and I remember somebody else was like, are you crazy? You know, that took four hours. And I was like, it was awesome. I yes. Loved it. I just loved everything about it. Um, also, let's see, there was another one that came to mind, which I just forgotten. Um, I do remember, I remember my first Verdi Requiem. Um, yes. And, and I remember that really well because I had just come back from New Zealand. I'd gone to New Zealand for my trial. Uh -huh. For like, like to, to, to play in the orchestra. Um, I was there for seven weeks actually, because I was the only one and they just gave me this whole big, huge amount of time. Um, and, um, and then toward the end of it, I noticed there's something wrong with my horn. There's, I had some wood rot and I could see some like bubbling coming up through the, um, varnish. So I had to um, drop it off. I flew back via LA, dropped it off, uh, or had it checked out at the repair guys there. I think I ended up sending it to Toronto actually to, to, um, to Shane and, and, um, Frank at the time. And, um, and then, then I, I still hadn't sold my, uh, my older, my 11,000 
heckle. So I had to play Verity on this instrument that I was no longer acquainted to with. And it was very exciting. I mean, that, that made a big imprint because mm -hmm. it was like, I, I knew that there was such a piece, but I had never really looked into it. Like, I didn't realize how much there is to play in that. So mm. that one definitely sticks out. And I also remember playing that again just a few years ago at um, in Jackson Hole in the Grand Teton. Um, um, it was just, I don't know, it was just one of those weeks that just like the orchestra sounded amazing and the, everything was like really this great vibe. And then after a couple of days of that, then the choir comes in and you're like, oh man, this is like a great choir too. And it was just, it was just like, ah, that was very exciting. Was really cool. How do you cope with music performance anxiety? <laughs> Well, I think that story that I told you about with the, the first year in in Washington, it kind of says, says a lot for, about kind of how I've dealt with it. I mean, I have never had like horrible performance anxiety. Mm. Uh, just getting comfortable here. Aww. <laughs> um, um, yeah, I, I, I mean, I think on the one hand, yeah, despite, you know, having gone on and on about, um, the um, fraud syndrome, whatever imposter syndrome. Right. Um, in terms of actual like getting up and I, the only time I can in my life I can remember just absolutely being freaked out. Uh -huh. was I, my very very first little piano recital, and I remember my knees were shaking and I was like trying to like steady my leg on the. I, I mean I must have been like eight years old. I was so scared. <laughs> um, but I don't remember having. Um, mm. I mean I, I've had some nerves um but I, it's it's kind of more like a for me it's been it, it's been more about uh like that first year in in dc that i was describing so so i'm here and i'm playing this job but i'm kind of thinking i have to do this at the absolute highest level that i can yes. because you know, i'm the first person in a major orchestra here and you know and obviously i have some skill because you know i did just almost win both of their auditions and yes. you know i mean it's I, I don't mean to sound like i'm just absolutely so self-critical i mean i i i know what i sound like right so yes. but um there was still, you know there's still always just the reality of of ours of our field that a lot of people a lot of good people don't end up actually getting the job um but what i did that first year was just yeah because i thought well you know, they're basically stuck with me for this year. They're going to have another audition. I'm going to, I'll, I'll do my best. You know, the feedback seemed pretty good, but I also just would literally like, if, if I ever started feeling like kind of stressed out about it, just like, you know, you can spend this concert being worried or you can yeah. enjoy this concert. You can do yes. one. You just like, I mean, I think that was like my, sort of my little entry level mindfulness. Like I had, I had taken some meditation courses, um, in, um, when I was in New Zealand. And I think that I, I started to get a sense of just like how you do have choices of like where to focus your attention. Yes. And and I would I would just think like you know pretend this is the last time you ever get to play this piece. Mm -hmm. um, and you know we were doing a lot of things that I had not ever played before. But I was also playing a lot of like I remember playing like Firebird. I mean that was definitely one. Of, and I'm just like these I I first played my first Firebird when I was like 16. At Eastern mm -hmm. Festival, like I, and it went pretty well. Like, there's no reason for me to fall apart to think I'm going to fall apart doing this. Right. And I'm just thinking, like, and it's so beautiful. It's like, what? If, yeah, what if, literally, like, after this concert, I walk out of the Kennedy Center and I step off the curb and I get hit by a bus, and that'll be the end of it. Like, what would be the point of all that worrying? Why don't I just like enjoy this as if it's you know the last day of camp or something, the last something, and um, and. Yeah, you know, I think over over the years, I mean, it's not like I don't. It, I think you, you get a sense of people in. I mean, you have a whole stage full of a hundred people or whatever, and most of us, if you know, end up in a conversation, every people will say to each other, "Wait, you get nervous? I never, I can't tell. I didn't think you get nervous." Right. And that's what everybody's saying to each other. Yeah. So it's, I, you know, I think that you, you do. You probably aren't going to get to that get through the the hoops of the um the stages right. of you know getting suddenly find yourself in a in major orchestra now you're suddenly like oh my god i'm scared because it's like you've already done this yes in so many other kinds of situations and mm. you know i mean it's it, there's a lot of just kind of 
I don't, I don't honestly, it's, it's, I mean, it's an important question, but it's also something that I have to think about a huge amount. It's more right. just like, I want to, you want to be ready for the first rehearsal. Right. I mean, honestly, that's, that's more the hoop to get through. Like, like during the season, it's like to be ready for that first rehearsal, right. you know, the part to have the reads ready. Cause you know, if I'm still scrambling to find a read, you know, between the first and the, you know, I want to be, I want to use the first couple of days of rehearsal to, you know, figure out which reads are going to be the ones that are going to be there for me. I don't want to like, so I don't want to be like, oh my God, I have nothing. You know, you, you have to commit and you just like, here I am, this is what I'm doing. And so, yeah. And, and you just, I think you don't, I don't think, I mean, th this is, yeah, you're asking a question of somebody who's, you know, been doing this professionally for a long time. So you like, you, you're not thinking about the audience that much. Mm -hmm. I mean, sometimes it can be helpful. I've heard a lot of people say in these sorts of interviews that they find it helpful to think that, you know, that imagine that there's somebody out in the audience who's like never heard this piece before, who had a really terrible day. And, you know, just actually try to remember like who is out there and yes. they're not sitting there to listen to see if you love the attack of Chekhov's mm -hmm. piece six or if your E is too sharp or too loud or whatever. You know, they're here to hear, you have to kind of get outside of your own, like, I mean, you know, it's not just that we're just one person of a hundred, we're the bassoonist. It's like, you know, it's like, you're not, you're not even the oboist. You're like, you're not that important. So to, so to get like all wrapped up in, in that and uh -huh. just instead to focus on, you know, connecting, you know, yeah, I just don't think about it that much really. Mm -hmm. Could you talk more about your ultra marathon running and cycling? Yay, I would love to. So um, this is also kind of funny because I lived in, um, I was not an athletic child or young adult or, um, and I lived in New Mexico, in Albuquerque for three years and then in New Zealand for almost three years. And I mean, I'd get outside sometimes and do some hikes or tramps, um, but I didn't, I wasn't really an outdoorsy person. I did start, when I was living in New Zealand, I started like, like I had a car there and I, I drove all over the country because, you know, and, and then maybe I'd get out and do like a hike for a couple of hours. But it was really only when I got back to the United States, I think having lived in these two really amazing places. And then I was here, I was back on the East coast where I'd grown up and gone to school. And I mean, it, it has its charms. It has, its, I mean, obviously this feels like home. I like living in an urban environment. Um, but it's, it's not the American West or New Zealand. <laughs> Right. I mean, our, the Shenandoahs are pretty, but it's not the Rocky Mountains. It's not so, but I really made it a conscious decision to spend more time you know, being outside and being active. And one day I was out cycling with a couple of friends and on the very, very flat Zeno Canal. And they're like, can we go a little faster? Like we're really cold. And I was like, I don't know. I'm trying. And I was terrible at it. So then I decided I would take some spinning classes. I had a gym membership. That's, that's how I exercise. I would like take aerobics classes, you know, <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and then, um, I started taking these spinning classes and then I, you know, ended up having meeting some guy on Jade Aid who was telling me about some bike tour he had done in Utah and Arizona, like where they went to like the Grand Canyon and Bryce and Zion on, you know, they bicycled. And I was like, that sounds cool. And so I signed up for that. We broke up, of course, um, but I mean, he had already done the trip, but he showed me his pictures. I, I didn't know Utah looked like that. I didn't know, what, I didn't know anything. I didn't really, I was, even though I had spent one year living in Austria and then another few years living in New Zealand and whatever, how long in New Mexico, three years, I was just, just not, I was completely clueless about, you know, adventure or travel or, what anything, um, you know, all this stuff that I do now was just absolutely foreign to me, but I, so I went out and I did that and I realized that I liked cycling long distances. And then, yes. then I discovered that there was such a thing as like bike packing or bicycle touring where you pack your panniers on your bike. And I thought, Ooh, I want to do that. So I signed up for a tour to do that. And that's where I met my spouse, Bill, who also it was from Washington, but we both met on this trip in Oregon. That was convenient. Um, and then, um, so then, yeah, so the, we, we, then I started, you know, I went on my own to Chile with my bike and just me and my bike and my tent and, um, 
gone to India together. I, I did a trip in Ethiopia and um, just bunches of cool places. Um, Norway, um, we did a couple of trips in Iceland. Those weren't cycling though, but I just, yeah, I just realized once I got back to DC and that I really somehow it just having lived in a place that looked like New Zealand and then coming back and living in Washington, just, I just felt super inspired to just get outside and, and go do things. And um, yeah, and, and the running just kind of came up also just, just kind of sort of happenstance. I was hiking one day um, out in the Tetons and some people ran by me and one person stopped and she was like, Oh, we're on a 50 K we're, you know, running. And I was just like, mm, people run, you know, cause I was on a 20 mile hike that day, which I thought was pretty badass. I mean, it, and it's like, I wasn't doing it to be a badass. I just wanted to get to that place and back. That's where it was. So it's like, I can do a nine mile hike to this place, but if I can do 20, I can get there. And then when I found out that if you do 30 miles, you can get there and there, like you can just see much, so much more. And um, I don't know, I just, it was just somehow really, really appealed to me. I had never, I'd never really liked running that much, um, but I had kind of, yeah, I think at that point I hadn't even done maybe a half marathon. Um, I, you know, I'd run like two or three miles sometimes, like just not that often. My, my, um, but I, happened to notice that the uh, Marine Corps Marathon was on my 50th birthday. So I thought, well, this seems, this will, this will be the year that I'll do it. So I signed up for that and, and you know, I didn't particularly love it, but I was really intrigued by the idea of trying to do it again and like enjoy it more. And I mean, I think, and that's where it really came back to like realizing how, how similar this kind of stuff is to like musical journey. Yes. Like I was out there doing this thing but I didn't really love it. But I was thinking like, so what is it about this that I don't like? And what don't I like? And, or what, what would make it different? And, you know, what are, what is, what's motivating me to do this in the first place? Right. Like I think, and, and then, um, that was, so that was five years ago. Um, I think, yeah, the combination of kind of just being able to be outside for more hours and mm -hmm. that, the fact that, I mean, as much as I love cycling, like I'm not a good mountain biker like I don't have skills to um and again I probably could develop them but most of my cycling was road riding or mm -hmm. or if it's backcountry it's still like on jeep roads or something like I can't do single track but if if you're on foot you can mm -hmm. really just get deep into it and and that's what I really really loved so um so anyway oh, but what I want to say though actually this was how, how things relate to music. Cause it, it, it's, there's so many different kind of analogies that I, that come to mind, especially when I'm out, you know, in, in a, in a long run. Um, and yeah, like part of it is like, let's say you have on your calendar, like the audition day here uh -huh. or, and that like the equivalent would be like, this is when the race is. I mean, you know, they call it races, it's not, but it's, it's just, you know, you have to meet some time cutoffs, but I mean, most people aren't racing, right? We're just out there to, to try to, to finish. Right. Um, and, but then like the training, then you kind of work backwards, like, okay, you know, you, you, you work out sort of your training plan kind of for that. And that kind of reminded me of how I worked out like audition preparation plans. And like, I want to be here by this point and here by that point, but also that I, you wanted to, you wanted to be, um, through my, you know, dec basically how decade and a half of taking auditions, um, I had become aware of sort of where my brain was, like when I was preparing for an audition, like am I, why am I doing this and how do I feel about this? And like, I remember somebody saying somewhere along the line, I heard somebody say something about like, you want every excerpt to be like your favorite excerpt. And I remember thinking that that's like such the opposite of the way a lot of us feel about them mm -hmm. it's almost like oh my god i hope they don't ask this oh god this one oh no not that one no not that one you know <laughs> and um you know and and i you know started to realize that um like if you it's not really about the event it's not about the audition and it's not about the race for most of us it, it, or it, it, it can't be even if even if you are very serious about it mm -hmm. you have to accept that it might just not might not be your day it mm -hmm. just might not be your day. And I mean, I know some 
people who are much, much better runners than I am who are like serious competitive runners. But, you know, sometimes they sometimes you get a DNF and did not finish. You, you don't feel well. You, you just it's just not working for you that day. And um, so, you know, that kind of brings to mind them. Yeah. Like, again, like, why are you doing this? And if you're not enjoying the mm -hmm. preparation to it. And I have to say that the pandemic has been actually really amazing for me in that way. Not so much for the bassoon, which I don't play very much these days, but for the running um, without any like big trips to plan for or big mm -hmm. um, races. It's just all about like the day to day. Like how does this fit into my daily life? Uh -huh. And that, and, and to enjoy that, to enjoy the process. So like when I do get out the bassoon, you know, obviously it's not because I have an audition coming up or a concert coming up or because I need to come up with a read for something. It's just like, because this is fun now. Right. And I think that that's kind of a good way to try to like live your life. <laughs> it's uh -huh. just like try to like, I am enjoying this now. Um, I'm definitely becoming a much better runner as, as a result of it because like there's just so much joy and like exploration and curiosity in, you know, when I'm out there. Mm -hmm. um, there, I do want to say one other thing. Sorry, I'm kind of rambling, but the um, the the way it often relates to music too is like when I when I teach, when I taught, I would often use a lot of sort of motion analogies, like like if you you know like I mean a lot many people like preparation, like you think about somebody hitting a tennis ball, like there's the preparation, there's the backswing, there's the contact, there's the follow through, and you know that's how like we have to approach our attacks. You know, you can't just like start from the stasis and um, things need to be in motion. Um, and I also like the, the whole, like, I, I'm very much enamored with the tabby toe slash as channeled by David McGill, like numbering system of counting, like counting the inner parts of beats. Mm -hmm. Um, so instead of going like one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, you go one, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. So that the the mm -hmm. highest number is is the one you're you're lead, always going toward the beat rather than trailing off from the beat. Yes. And um, I realized that that really helped with my cycling and with running too, because like if I if I could plan like I was cycling on some like sandy surfaces and I kept kind of I, I was looking down or like it's, it's like skiing too. Like if you look at your tips, your ski or whatever, anything you're driving, you have to look further ahead. And if you can kind of organize your motion toward that with almost like an acceleration toward the next beat. So I think about that a lot. Like when I'm running, I count steps that way sometimes. And when sometimes when I'm practicing, like I'll just kind of think like, imagine this is like, I'm trying to get through some gnarly technical bit. And I'm thinking like, what if this were like some rocky terrain or running, what would you do? You, you need to stay upright. I mean, <laughs> So s slow down, kind of smooth into it, figure out a way that you can do this all with good form. You know, mm -hmm. when you're practicing, you have the ability to kind of stretch things out and really look at them and, but doing them in, in a gesture, which is mm -hmm. the same way as like, like if you're walking or, or you're running or like when I walk with my dog, sometimes I try to just really sort of let her lead. And so if she wants to go fast, I'll go a little faster. If she wants to slow down and sniff, I, I'll slow down. But I try to do it without ever breaking my stride, just like slowing down gracefully, mm -hmm. speeding up. And it, it's like music. It's like following somebody else's um, rubato or something. Yes. You really have to be paying attention. And you have to be paying attention while you're in motion. Um, so, I mean, you said yes. Yeah, so I was going to say, does that make sense? So I guess it kind of makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, just the flow and with yoga. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Just, just having the flow. And, and also like, I just recently reread born to run again. And the guy yeah. was like, you know, he's like, if you're having trouble, okay, you want to go, okay, how's it go? Easy, light, fast. So first you go for easy. Uh -huh. First you go for easy. And if I ever teach again, this is what I'm, this is going to be my thing. <laughs> first you go for easy. So you, you want to get the thing playing, play the thing in a way that you can execute it beautifully and easily. And what the way the guy's talking about it in the, you know, in the race or the, in the ultra marathon or whatever, it's just, if all you can manage is an easy walk, then that's all you got, but you, but you're moving. So if, you know, if all you can do is play this as a quarter and it equals one, <laughs> you know, but do it with, you know, and then the next thing you want to look for is light. Mm -hmm. So, you know, so maybe can you now like, you know, maybe pick up your feet a little bit, but just keep it easy, but keep some more flow. And I think like that's 
like you know how does that translate on on what we do uh, like maybe a little bit more support just with a little bit less effort i mean and only then are you allowed to start moving faster right um because it's it's so easy for us to just try to uh, do something right ever but if you know i i would always say you know only play something at the speed where you can make it make sense and have poise and have good sound production and be beautiful and if you know if if you can only do those two bars at, you know, a 10th of the tempo, that's where the work is going to happen. You know, you, you get that, you get that easy light. And now, now you've got everything. Mm. So I, I do think about that a lot. Mm. With your running and cycling, did you find your lungs and your capacity and strength and, and body change your bassoon playing? No, not really, actually. I, it's, it, I mean, it would seem like it would make sense. Um, but, um, I mean, I don't have, like, pains and stuff. But, um, but I didn't really have a huge amount of problems with that before anyway. I mean, I always just, you know, used to, I mean, I also used to kind of think, like, look at Pavarotti. You know, I doubt he could run an ultra, but he probably had pretty good breath control. Right? Mm. So I, I think that I don't, I mean, I am a tiny little person and... I have to take, but like, so is Judy and she, she can play like phrases much longer than I can. So I don't think it has to do with your aerobic capacity as much as like mm. sort of how you balance your reads and your, your, I mean, maybe she just has a giant lung capacity or maybe, maybe there was edits on her recordings. I'm just listening to that going like, <laughs> how did she do that all in one breath? I can't do that. <laughs> Have you experienced any music related injuries? Yeah, and no, no, I mean, other than cutting my fingers with my reed knives. Oh, um, yeah. And uh, <laughs> wire punctures. <laughs> yes, definitely wire punctures. Um, yeah. Were there any adventure injuries that you wanted to share about? I definitely have had some adventure injuries. And actually, yeah, we were talking about this before. I think that um, it sort of relates to some of the anxieties and you know maybe performance anxiety that you were thinking or or trying to figure out what is somebody going to like in an audition or are they going to like me or this it's like we're, we're so it's so easy for us to kind of try to figure out like what do i have to do in order to get this outcome or to prevent that outcome so mm. you know again um to just bring my parents into it a little bit like when i first started cycling when i told them i was going to go by myself down to to Chile and Argentina and cycle through the Andes by myself. And then I was well into my thirties at this time. So it's like, they, it's not like I was 12 years old trying to do this. They were like freaked out. They, they thought that sounded really scary. Um, and it's like, you know, I, and I've done a lot of independent travel, but the things that have happened, I have had a couple of mishaps. I crashed on my bike on, in, but it was in an Ari it was in Arizona at a, like a, it was like a little bike camp where we all stayed at the same hotel. And we all went out and group, you know, and did these rides during the day. And, you know, and so, and then I, I was like scuba diving and at one point and then a, a different trip. Um, and, um, something weird happened. I don't know. I just ended up passing out and, and ended up in the hospital. Um, but also, you know, it was something that was very well, um, organized uh -huh. you know, with a group of people and, um, so, I mean, nothing bad ever happened to me on these solo trips that I did, which doesn't mean that they couldn't or that something god awful might not happen, but it's just, that's not the things that anybody predicted. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, oh my God, you did that alone? Why don't you do some nice thing? And, you know, why are you going to those other countries by yourself when you could do something nice and safe here in America? It's like, well, you know, here's two things I didn't done in America that were supposed to be, you know, I mean, you might, I guess one could say, well, why were you scuba diving or riding your bike at all? But you know, I, I have yet to have any sort of, you know, I mean, horrible things happen. It's just not the things that, that, that we anticipate is, is I guess where I'm going with that. And I, and I think that that's also often the case with, um, with music and with playing and with how people perceive us and how a concert goes or whatever. And I mean, I often have like something coming up and I'll be like, nervous about it. I'll be like, sure. Oh my God, this is going to be the one we're going to make. It. I'm screwed. Like I'll say to Bill, it's like, oh my God, I'm screwed. And he goes, yeah, I know you all are. <laughs> I mean, he's, he's heard this so many times over mm -hmm. the years. Like I'll, it'll be like, 
Sunday night, Monday night, you know, first rehearsals, Tuesday morning. And I'm like, oh, fuck it, I'm not prepared. And he goes, yeah, I know you're not. <laughs> so many times. But, but the thing is, and then it, it's, I mean, it's always fine. Uh -huh. right? it, but because it, it's in your head, like that this, whatever I'm doing that isn't good enough, that's going to be the thing, you know, or whatever. So and I've had so many weeks that I've come in thinking like, this is like a, some solo that it was really hard for me. And I like figured out, like every time Tchaikovsky 6 comes up and I'll be like kind of waiting for the praise, like nobody's saying anything. It's like, oh, that's really bad. And, <laughs> and I, again, I don't want you to think that this is like overwhelming. I mean, I'm, you know, it's not a, it's not yeah. an overwhelming, like soul crushing kind of thing, but mm -hmm. you know, one wonders, it's just like, uh -huh. is that not good? How come nobody said anything? And then like, <laughs> yeah. they're like, I didn't think that was hard. I didn't know that was hard. And I'm like, I guess that's good. But yeah, then that's there'll be other you. weeks where like, I remember we did something, I think it was like the Walton Viola concert or something, a piece that I had never heard before. You know, I got the music. I probably listened to it, you know, once before the rehearsal went through, find out, you know, which of the things make sure I'm ready to, you know, to, to, to be in the right place at the right time. And I had some solos and people were like, wow, you sound so great on this. You blah, 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 blah. And I'm like, this is so easy. <laughs> like, where were you, Tchaikovsky, six weeks? Yeah. <laughs> People, you know, it, it's it's like we get it. We get these things into our head that uh -huh. that, that it's this is that this means that or, or something that this has this danger or, or that this has is going to get this kind of response from people or that people aren't they're not going to like them something you know. And it's it's we're often just. I, I mean, I think the lesson to learn from that isn't just to blow it all off, but it's just to just kind of stay focused on what you know is good. Take the advice from people that you trust and you know, somehow know, or try to remember the times in your life when you were absolutely sure that something was going to get this kind of reaction and it didn't, you know, and, and often it's, it's the one you think it's going to get a bad reaction and it doesn't. And you're like, God, I spent all this time like panicking and worried about that. That wasn't going to be good enough. And, you know, nobody was even paying any attention to that. They're all listening to that guy over there or whatever. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Been, you know, pretty lucky with the, um, with both the, the performance and the, uh, and the, I mean, I, I fall, I mean, if you can see my knees right now, I still fall all the time, all the time on the rocks and I still screw up all the time on the bassoon, but it's okay. It's okay. <laughs> you know, it happens, it happens to all mm -hmm. of us. Mm hmm. Who do you think I should interview next? Wow, so many interesting people. Um, I actually, so I was telling you um, in, in our little pre-interview, pre I was listening to um, Bassoons Without Borders last week, and it was really nice to hear Celeste Marie Roy um, talking and, and playing. Um, so she she was somebody that I go back, we, way back, we were at like a BUTI together in 1983, I think. Um, she's principal in Swiss Vermont and very, very cool person. And she had a lot of really interesting things to say. Nadina is nothing if not interesting. Mm -hmm. Nadina Jackson. Yeah, <laughs> definitely. <laughs> Stefan, I mean, all these people. Mm. Chris Millard. Mm. Yeah. yeah, so many good people. <laughs> and, well, and, so, and so interesting in, in, in such different, such different ways, like different ways of talking about about things. Um, yeah, yeah it I'm is telling you, I was listening to the, your Barry Stees, um, the, the Q and A a few, couple weeks ago, and it was so interesting to hear sort of, I mean, because in a lot of ways we're, we have a lot in common and we're both running and we're both like, you know, in these orchestral jobs, you know, the same generation. Um, but still to hear, you know, we, our approaches are very different. Mm. So yeah, yeah, I'm loving too hearing all the different paths and journeys and interests and hobbies and it is really fascinating how we're all in this, you know, same bassoon community, but um, all quite unique. Hmm. So thank you so much for your time today. I really appreciate the opportunity to interview you and just hear more about your life and career as a professional musician. Yeah, it's really nice to connect with you again. For everyone tuning in, keep an eye out for new videos with great bassoon guests every Thursday, Central Standard Time. 
On the Let's Link project, every guest interviewed here is hosting a free online panel discussion via Zoom the following Sunday, Central Standard Time, and you can register for Sue's session on the Music Link website. Please like, comment, and share any questions or feedback in the section below, and subscribe to this channel for new video notifications each week. Check out the Instagram and Facebook pages for more updates too. The Music Link is a New Zealand-based online resource for people to share, learn, and connect. Thank you for watching, and I'll see y'all in the next video.